Hello everyone, welcome to the Arbitration Channel. My name is Lauro Parente, and today we continue a series of interviews with the big names in international arbitration. These interviews are conducted by Mauricio Gon. Mauricio is a GST LLP partner in international arbitration. The Arbitration Channel is a think tank that discusses alternative dispute resolution methods focused in arbitration. And this work is made possible by our sponsors who support our initiatives. Now we're going to take the floor to Mauricio. Hello, Mauricio. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Mauricio Gom. And today I have an honor, a pleasure, a privilege, and a satisfaction to talk with Ms. Anne Ryan Robinson. Ms. Robinson, as many of you know, she is the current president of the Charter Institute of the Arbitrators. And we will have a lot of things to talk and discuss about her role as the president of the CR. Before we start, I'd like to thank Canal Arbitragem for creating this channel to promote discussion in an informal way with very prominent people in the world of international arbitration. So thank you, Lauro Parente, for such great initiative. Now, since we have and Ryan Robinson, I would like to start by asking her how, when, and where did we start your brilliant, outstanding career in arbitration? Well, Mauricio, thank you very much, first of all, for that very flattering uh, introduction. Uh, I'm happy to tell you how I got started in this career, and it's not really the same way that a lot of people did. I had actually been a trial attorney handling very high-profile cases, primarily on the defense side, and I was involved in a case in which there had been a plant explosion. A number of people, unfortunately, had died, and I was representing the primary defendant, as were two other law firms. So as you can imagine, since there were about 20 defendants, we were the target and it was extremely busy time and we divided our task. And I was what we would call in Texas, the law lawyer, meaning I was the one who went and argued before the court every motion. So as a result, I knew everything that had happened in that case. Well, we ultimately settled the case for $250 million. And we had a dispute with the third layer of insurance regarding whether or not there should be coverage. So we entered into a high-low agreement, uh, an 80-20 agreement, and we agreed that we would arbitrate the dispute in London. And because I had been the law lawyer, I ended yeah. up testifying at that particular um, arbitration. And it was my first experience, and it was I was very intrigued by it. Here were three men who were making a decision, and it was men, three men making this decision in a closed room. No court reporter was going to be publishing something that would be then disseminated across um, the public. And I thought, I need to know more about this. I think I actually want to do this. I want to make this my career. But there was just one problem, and that is I really didn't know anything about international law. So I left the firm where I was, where I was a partner, and I went back to school and I got an LLM in international economic law so that I would have this infusion of international law as quickly as possible. And I started my career over and it has taken a while to ultimately get where I am, but I'm extremely happy where I am, which is at Lock Lord in its uh, Houston office. And so basically that's how my career in arbitration got started. I might add, that during that time, I also uh, had the great fortune to meet the then chair of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators North America branch, Henry Alvarez, who put me on the path to taking the Chartered Institute training, which I did. And of course, I have been very active in the Chartered Institute ever since. If I may ask, uh, how long was that uh, um, um, in? How long I've been in the this Chartered Institute? 
No, no, in this experience, when you started, this case you've uh -huh. mentioned, so uh -huh. this was just, just to have an idea in terms of how long have you been involved with arbitration? Uh, about 20 years now. 20 years. Right. Uh, if, if we can compare 20 years ago and today, uh, do you see uh, any difference as the way people work, act, serve, practice arbitration, or is just a different, or is the same, or is just there are more people involved, more players, or because you've mentioned before you appear before uh, uh, a panel of three uh, probably English lawyers. Uh, so was there any, can we draw any distinction from 20 years ago and today or not? Well, I think there is a distinction. You know, the Chartered Institute itself has a tagline evolving to resolve. And I think that you could take that into arbitration itself and into the institutions. If you look at the rules themselves of the various arbitral institutions and how those have changed over the last 20 years, you see a number of differences. One of those is the fact that, for instance, the ICDR introduced emergency arbitrators, which are, are now uh, almost in every major institution's rules. Now we're struggling with the questions of consolidation. We're struggling with the questions of joinder. Uh, we have the issue of double hatting that's rearing its head, third party funding. And all of these are challenges and forces that hadn't even been thought of uh, 20 years ago. And I'm glad you mentioned the fact that it was three men since I had mentioned it. And of course, one of the things that the Chartered Institute is focusing on this year is in fact, diversity and inclusion and equality among uh, arbitrators, mediators, and also adjudicators. Uh, we had, of course, the pledge that came about a number of years ago, and now we have uh, real, which is also raising the issue of race in arbitration. All of these things are very important. So I think that the the face of arbitration is slowly, slowly, but but going in the right direction and changing. Unfortunately, if you do look at the statistics, um, those that are considered to be minorities, including women that are appointed, are typically appointed not by the parties, but by the institutions themselves. And so that is one area in which we as a community need to continue to work on making certain that we, in fact, are evolving to us all. Interesting. And um, uh, we are going to touch on the uh, the CR in a moment. But uh, as I understand, you are, since you've mentioned the role of women in arbitration, you are, if I understand correctly, a founding member of Arbitral Women. Uh, what is the, uh, 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 apart from the obvious conclusion by the, just the name of this institution, so how, um, how Arbitral Women is doing in order to promote uh, the presence of women in international arbitration? You know, Arbitral Women was actually the brainchild of um, Louise Barrington and Mariz, and I can't take credit for it. I mean, they looked around and they went to conferences and saw there were very few women, and they decided that they were going to do something about it. And it grew from a nucleus of women to now there's, a, uh, I don't know how many members we have, but many across the globe. And in not only is it a member organization, it does actively support women in arbitration. And one of the ways that it does that is by providing scholarships so that uh, female students can participate in the Viz Moot. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I remember one year, a number of years ago, there was a team from Afghanistan that had come um, to participate in the Viz Moot. They also haven't forgotten the men and they've always had uh, honors that they've given men that have been very supportive of women in arbitration. Yeah, since um, since and you've mentioned some numbers, very impressive numbers regarding arbitral women. Let's move a little bit now to CR. And when we talk about CR, the numbers are staggering. So we we know 
that, uh, or for those who don't know, uh, CR has 17,000 members across the world in 149 countries. Um, and this is, uh, I, I would like, and if you could just tell us a, a little bit of the CRB itself and the work of CRB throughout the years and with an eye to the future. I know it's a sort of an entire lecture, but if you can uh, just give us that, um, um, this perspective, that would be great. I'd be happy to do so. And I've, I'm also very happy to tell you that that number now is over 18,000. So we have uh, increased our membership quite a bit over this past year. And I think part of that's due to the fact that we do have a bit of a silver lining here with the ability to reach out to people on Zoom like we're doing right now. And it's made, it's made the Chartered Institute in some instances more relevant in some areas that it might have been or not been in the past. But about the Chartered Institute itself, you know, it's been around since 1915. It was actually started by five men, uh, again, men, because that's how it was back then. Uh, it was two solicitors, an accountant, an engineer, and a surveyor. And they had the aim of raising the status of arbitrator to the dignity of a distinct and recognized learned profession. And in 1979, the Institute was granted a Royal Charter and under the terms of the Royal Charter, the Chartered Institute has a public interest mandate. And that mandate is to promote, excuse me, to promote and facilitate worldwide the determination of disputes by arbitration and alternative means of private dispute resolution other than by resolution by the courts. At its heart, the institution is an educational organization and as Mauricio knows, uh, the Chartered Institute offers various training programs, both on a mediation track and also on an arbitration track to train people to be arbitrators or to be mediators. And each of us who reaches a certain level is allowed to use post nominals after our name. If you are an associate member, which is the lowest member, that would be a CIAR. Then you have member with a capital M, which would be MCIR. And then you have fellow, which is FCIR. And then within that 18,000 members, there's about 500 that have the designation of chartered arbitrator. Now, to be a member of the Chartered Institute, you have to show certain uh, knowledge. You have to show that certain temperament. Uh, if you're training to be a fellow, uh, you are assessed by other fellows as to whether or not you are appropriate to be designated as a fellow. You are assessed on such things as your temperament, on your knowledge of uncertain rules, on the manner in which you might handle certain thorny questions. And this is very important because those post nominals themselves are recognized worldwide. And they're recognized worldwide for two reasons. One, which I've just told you, it represents that this is a person that has had appropriate training, knows how to run an arbitration, knows how to run a mediation. But secondly, that they are subject to a code of ethics. You know, one of the issues that has been kicked around is whether or not there should be some universal body that determines the ethics for international arbitrators. In a recent seminar, that question was put to the audience and 60% of them said no. And that is why the Chartered Institute is extremely important. Because if you see those letters behind that person's name, you know that in fact they are subject to a code of ethics. And in fact, the Chartered Institute, if claims are brought against a member after giving that member due process, have the power to oust that member from the organization for its violation of ethical norms. So we also collaborate with other organizations because we are at our heart a educational group. So you, for instance, I had an opportunity to do a fireside chat with the new president of the ICC, Claudia Solomon. 
Um, I've had an opportunity to work with the ICDR, and I'm sure there will be other opportunities in the coming year for the new president who will be coming in in January of uh, 2022. So in addition to training, in addition to the ethics and collaboration, the other thing that we do is we interact and collaborate with governments to assist them in developing appropriate legislation to foster arbitration and mediation in their particular countries. Interesting, interesting. This reminds me uh, uh, one specific um, uh, uh, bill that has been or was before the U.S. Parliament, which is the AFA, Arbitration Fairness Act. Right. I remember when it was originally drafted, that raised the eyebrows of many people. And uh, I think that um, AFA uh, uh, now is not as a sort of a, a, um, a very uh, concerning uh, piece at least a, a, a bill that may be one day become uh, become uh, uh, become law, but um, my my so you've mentioned inclusion, and I think that's the moment that we are living in the inclusion, um, diversity, and I'm very happy, very happy, very pleased to say that recently in Brazil uh, through CR um, the program called capacity sharing program. That is a fascinating program in order to foster, in order to encourage the so-called more underserved or underdeveloped uh, regions as far as arbitration is concerned. Nothing regarding to economic, social, it's, is what we may say, especially in a country such as Brazil, a sort of a continental country, so you see arbitration, mediation, flourishing, uh, well-developed in centers such as Southeast, Sao Paulo, Rio, etc. But there are places in Brazil, Northeast, North of Brazil, that uh, should receive, and they did receive last week, a very interesting program through CRB called Capacity Sharing Program. And I'm very pleased to say, and Ryan, that Last week, beginning of uh, the end of last week, in a moot competition in Brazil, two students from the north region, northern region of Manaus, Amazonas, were considered to be the best speakers. So women, best speakers from a region, almost in the middle, if mean geographically speaking, in the middle of Amazon jungle. So this is fascinating. This is a, a very uh, serene uh, uh, information that arbitration is going in a very good direction. And, uh, and of course, the role of CR and CR has a very important role in that. Thank you once more for that. Um, uh, so let me, if I may, uh, uh, change gears now from Anne Ryan as a CR president to Anne Ryan as counsel or as arbitrator. I know you have, as I mentioned at the beginning, a vast experience as arbitrator and as counsel in international and domestic cases. Now, as far as the international arbitration is concerned, do you see a sort of a common denominator from arbitrators or counsel coming from common law jurisdictions, from those coming from civil law jurisdictions? Do you, as counsel, do you, how do you convince a panel who is composed of common law lawyers? How, as an arbitrator, you see a civil law lawyer trying to argue before you and your peers? So can you see or can you share some experiences, some hints, some thoughts, some inputs on these differences between common law and civil law, if we still have one? 
Well, I think in terms of arbitrators themselves, the, there is a common denominator now. And that common denominator is the result of the fact that almost all of the rules are very, very close in the provisions in them. And as a result, um, I think that you see that the arbitrators themselves, whether they come from a civil law background or a common law background, for the most part, are going to run an arbitration the same way. And I do think that the rules of persuasion that we have learned through um, various philosophers don't change from the common law to the civil law. So it becomes a question of delivery and how one delivers the arguments. So let's look at the common law versus the civil law. Now, for the common law lawyer, you know, the... Um, Testimony is everything. It fills in the blanks. For the civil law lawyer, typically it's the documents. And we see this arising, this issue arising most recently with the uh, adaption of the prog rules, which are an answer to the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. And they felt that the IBA rules with the Redfern schedule was much too um, common law oriented and therefore, you know, the Prague rules, you have to ask for a document at the preliminary hearing. There isn't a Redfern schedule. And also whether or not witnesses will testify is going to be determined primarily by the tribunal as opposed to by the parties. So in that instance, you do see this difference that is bubbling up as a pushback against what some would say is making arbitration too common law focused. But how do we argue? I would say that the civil law lawyers are typically much better still to this day in doing written submissions, where the common law lawyer is much better in presenting an oral argument. Now, that being said, I think we paint with too broad a brush if we say common law lawyers. For instance, I had a case recently in which I had a QC appearing before me and a Texas trial attorney. That is the only thing they had in common in terms of approach was that they were both from the common law. As you might imagine, the QC was very measured in how he presented the case, very English in how he presented the case. The Texas lawyer, on the other hand, had the usual flourishes that one might see if you were doing a jury trial in Texas. Now, that Texas lawyer knew the rules it wasn't an instance that he knew the rules. He had just been trained to do advocacy in a little different manner. So you can't really say it's a common law, civil law divide. I think it's even, you can parse it even more deeply than that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that with the advent of soft law, there has been a melding of traditions and therefore the differences that may have existed are not so great as they once were. Uh, yeah, I'm glad that you uh, you raised the soft law. I'm going to ask a question on that. But before doing so, um, uh, if we see the ICDR um, rules, for example, there is one specific provision, uh, it may be 21 or 22, where there is an express provision saying to the users and especially to American users saying that typical discovery tools normally used in US uh, judicial system or civil system is not uh, appropriate in international arbitration. So it's a message that the arbitrary institution is given to the world and is given to the users as well. It's a sort of that that sort of a combination between or approach uh, uh, between one and the other system. As far as witnesses, once I <laughs> once I hear something very interesting and very funny um, for a common law lawyer or a common law uh, judge or a, a common law party, the sun does not rise unless and until a witness says so. Right. Uh, so, and sometimes when I sit as arbitrator and I sit as arbitrator in domestic case in the West, domestic case in Brazil and in international cases, I see 
lawyers trying to get what the documents already say. Right. The documents say the witness has signed that, so the witness has already, uh, 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 it is crystal clear what the witness had said in that document, but there is a need for, uh, for counsel to get this from the mouth of the witness. It is, uh, it is interesting. Now, uh, turning to soft laws, and uh, I think that sort of a bridge, be the, the distance or the gap, if we may say, still say between common law and civil law. Do you, do you, do you think that international arbitration has become too dependent of uh, soft laws? And if so, is this a problem or is it just a matter of a going forward with an interesting denominator? And going to that, let me also ask you, and um, you've mentioned uh, uh, soft law, and uh, uh, there, are, there are quite a few, but one, since we're talking about, uh, um, I'm thinking about discovery, so I'm going to the uh, uh, IBA guidelines on taking of evidence. Um, there is a sort of a reaction, specifically in the Eastern world, Eastern Europe, that the IBA guidelines on taking off evidence is not a sort of a common denominator, but it's still too common law. So then there is a sort of a reaction being the Prague rules. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, uh, how do you see that uh, sort of uh, action and reaction and this dependency on soft laws? Well, I think that the IBA rules on the taking of evidence have become the norm. But as you and I both know, it requires that both parties agree to them for them to be applied. So what I'm seeing happen is that tribunals will state that they're going to be guided by them rather than saying that trying to force the parties to agree to them. And by being guided by them, then that in turn allows the arbitrators to have more flexibility than they might have if, in fact, they had had been subject to them as they are written. I think there are some good points in the IBA rules that we shouldn't forget about. Of course, we do have the Redfern schedule, which I do realize that the Prague rules are a pushback from that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But I think the Redfern schedule is a wonderful way to bridge the gap not only between the civil law and the common law, but the common law as it's practiced everywhere else, and it's practiced in the United States. Because in the United States, as you know, we just have to say any and all documents relating to, and the, and the documents we see do not even have to be admissible. They only have to lead to admissible evidence. When I teach my course, I tell my students that the words any and all do not exist in international arbitration, to strike them from their vocabulary. But I think there's another a provision in the IBA rules that is very helpful, and that is the one on the preparation of witness statements. As you know, in the United States, we have the ability to sit down with the witnesses, and so long as we don't try to change the truthfulness of their testimony, we may work with them regarding their testimony. Uh, in the common law in England and in Wales, it's a little bit different, it's more restricted, and we go to civil law countries where it's basically unheard of. So by having that provision in the IBA rules, it gives all the parties comfort on what the playing rules, of the ground rules are going to be, so that you don't have an instance in which a Texas lawyer has met with a witness freely, because they're ethically entitled to do so, and to have uh, a witness not be met with by his counsel, by his counsel is not comfortable doing so under the regime that he is used to. So I think that's another place where the IBA rules have really assisted. Now we have the Prague rules. And the Prague rules, as I mentioned, basically you have to request a document at the preliminary hearing. And if you fail to do so, you have to justify at the later date why you needed it. It also provides for the tribunal to appoint experts, where, as you know, in the common law country, we're, countries, we're used to hiring our own experts. I will tell you this, they're in their infancy. I don't see them at this point gaining much traction. And I base that on the fact that I was in a seminar a couple of weeks ago in which there were three very well known civil 
arbitrators, civil law arbitrators, and none of them had been involved in any case involving the Prague rules. So whether it's in its infancy or if it's gone too far the other direction so that common law lawyers will not be able to get comfortable with it, I don't know that answer. But it certainly is a reaction to the IBA rules. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, I've been um, I've been studying I study the Prague rules, but I can I I, I have to admit I haven't had any experience in real world using as guidelines or using the Prague rules. I think the parties are still not comfortable, uh, or um, it is as you said in its infancy. Time time will tell us. Uh, coming back to witness uh, and um, this relationship between witness and counsel, especially at the moment of drafting the written statement. Sometimes, and I see in uh, at the hearings, uh, one of the first questions from opposing counsel to the witness is, did you, by any chance, did you receive any support on drafting the written statement? If this question is addressed to a witness from common law environment, the answer normally is yes, yes. My counsel has helped me with drafting, but this is everything that it's there is my opinion. If you ask this to a, civil, a witness that comes from a civil law, sometimes there is some sort of a discomfort in, their, in her answer. Shall I say yes? Shall I say no? Shall I say a little bit? So now this drives me to one question. As an arbitrator, as an international arbitrator, when you see all the time those differences between common law and civil law, etc., how how far you intervene as, uh, or what is the moment you intervene um, in the question uh, asked from a common law or a civil law, or you just leave that as much as possible to counsel in redirect? Do you, how, how, how do you see uh, a good international arbitrate, arbitrate tour dealing with many differences, not only legal, but cultural differences in international arbitration? Well, let's take your witness question first, and then I'll move on to some cultural and some ideas about that that I have. You're right. I think that some of the civil law witnesses that coming from a civil law country are uncomfortable answering that question. And quite frankly, I think they should have been prepared that they were going to be asked that question and they should have been told that it's not a problem. But if in fact they are so uncomfortable in answering it and look, there's nothing wrong with the arbitrator with selling them, you know, it's perfectly okay for you to have uh, conferred with your counsel so long as what's here is in fact the truth. Um, and to just kind of put them at ease in, in that regard you do raise an interesting point about witness statements themselves, though, and that is that, you know, there is a way, as some of the studies have been showing, to unintentionally tamper with the memory of a witness. And the ICC has recently put out a report that I urge everyone to review because it does have some suggestions regarding how one can go about obtaining the witness statements without tainting the witness's memory on a particular point. And I think that's extremely important. I think it's important that the witness have the support of counsel in order to prepare the witness statements, just think what they would look like otherwise. But at the same time, it is important that it be the absolute truth and that the memory not be distorted um, in any way. Um, returning to your question about culture itself, I can give you two personal stories about how I try to pick arbitrators when I have uh, what I feel to be a cultural issue. And I think that sometimes we get too caught up in this idea of culture and it's not truly a cultural issue. And other times I think we need to be very cognizant of the fact. I had a case in which 
and I was counsel in this case, in which the client was Chinese and had purchased some equipment from a Turkish manufacturer, and a dispute had arisen. And the Chinese client had gone to Turkey to meet with the Turkish company in an attempt to settle the matter and was unable to settle it, thought they had settled it, sent the new agreement, which the Turkish company refused to sign, and then the Turkish company instituted arbitration. And interestingly enough, and this I think is also a cultural thing, had I been drafting that on the other side, I would not have mentioned the fact that the Chinese had come because I would see that as settlement negotiations, something that has no place in the arbitration. But the Turkish company put it in their statement of claim and actually went so far as to say that the client's um, actions were strange or some word along that line. So it seemed to me that it, need, I need, it was very important that I find someone that had a background in dealing with Chinese clients. That could be a professor that had taught in China, that could be counsel that had represented Chinese, or it could be someone who's an arbitrator who's arbitrated cases involving Chinese parties. Because as you and I know, the idea of mediating is very, very deep in Asia. And the idea that you try to settle and you don't have a dispute is sacrosanct. The result was we lost that case, but the result also was that each party was ordered to bear its own cost. And I see that as a victory. And I think that was because of the choice of the arbitrator that understood exactly what was going on there when there was this attempt to try to settle. The other example is also another case in which I was counsel in which the case was actually under the law of England and Wales. But tangentially, a law in the Middle East would have some effect on the absolute resolution of the case. And the other side was also talking about the society in the Middle East and how it was in an uproar and how dangerous it was and so forth. So I was looking for an arbitrator that came from that part of the world. So one, they would understand the civil law as it's practiced in the Middle East, because as we know, the civil law is not uh, homogenous. It differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And two, that this um, particular arbitrator would understand society in the Middle East and whether or not it was in the huge upheaval that was being asserted by the other side. So those are two instances in which I thought culture was very important. But I think there are other instances in which it is not. And it's going to have to be done on a case by case basis um, in determining just exactly who should be your arbitrator. And I will mention that that one where I got the Middle East arbitrator, he was also very familiar with the law of England and Wales because I wanted someone that did know, had some familiarity with the governing law as well. Fascinating. Very interesting. Uh, this. Um your comments uh, lead me to think uh, in terms of um, what we see in arbitrary institutions, such as the preparatory conference under ICDR, for example, case management conference under ICC. Uh, there is one specific uh, uh, provision, the ICDR rules, which is the administrative conference, which goes prior to the preparatory conference, which is held by the arbitrator. I think that's very important, very important to discuss many, many issues uh, that will lie ahead. But the administrative conference, which is held by the institution itself, not with, there is no arbitrator yet, but counsel from the parties. So you can see the institution can put counsel together for the first time sometimes to discuss issues that they were not, they had discussed before and also suggest mediation. You touched, you touched on mediation. And this is my question uh, uh, to you. And I know I see, uh, the CR also has uh, online courses uh, for mediation, has a very important role in mediation. And I can see from the Queen Mary uh, last survey addressed the topic of um, uh, uh, arbitration to a changing world in 
90% of the interviewees respond that international arbitration remains the preferred method of resolving cross-border disputes. Nothing new there. 31% on a standalone basis and 59% in conjunction of ADR. Do you think and that this so-called multi-tier clause, they really help or sometimes they create more problems than solutions? And uh, if I may, just going to, as you know, I can ask many questions at once, but I can, uh, since we, we are talking about mediation, I want to hear from you also, what's your take on the Singapore Convention? if this is going to be a sort of a New York convention or it's too far to think about this? Lots of questions there. Hopefully I'll get them in the right answer. There and if go. I miss one, you let me know. All right. There you go. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that uh, it was greatly my honor to be the chair of the rules revision committee for the ICDR. And if you look at their 2021 20, uh, rules, you will see that now, they require that you state affirmatively that you want to opt out of mediation in the filing of your statement of claim and in your defense. And that is a, a new wrinkle they have. And as you mentioned, their administrative conference, they always ask about mediation. So the presumption under the ICDR now is that, in fact, you will mediate um, regarding the step clauses themselves. Um, if they're drafted properly, and that's the key, drafted properly, uh, I think they can actually be very helpful. And it goes back to this idea of culture again. And I see many, many step clauses coming out of Asia. And so you make certain that you have in there when this time to mediate is to expire so that you don't run into an issue then if arbitration is instituted that someone comes in and claims that the tribunal does not have jurisdiction because mediation hasn't been completed or didn't occur. When we did the rollout of the ICDR rules in Singapore, they were all very excited by the fact that the ICDR rules uh, required an opt-out as opposed to an opt-in on mediation because it is such an important point in, in the culture itself. And I'm seeing step clauses that are, you know, three tiered with management, the first tier, then we go to mediation and then we go to arbitration. And I think those are becoming more and more common. And I think that the transactional people are getting more skilled in drafting them as they're starting to realize some of the problems that they have. The Singapore Convention is um, still as in its infancy, like the Prague rules. Uh, last time I checked, there were 55 that had signed and seven that had ratified, countries that had ratified, but the last country to ratify being Turkey. And the countries that have ratified are not necessarily countries that you would think were going to be large trading pro uh, partners. But I think there's a couple of things about the Singapore Convention that we may have a tendency to overlook. And that is that, for instance, in Turkey, if I had a mediated settlement agreement that met the requirements under the Singapore Convention, I could enforce it in Turkey, even though it was mediated someplace else in a country that is not a signatory. So that's a new wrinkle, unlike something that we, unlike the New York Convention. Um, I might also add that the ICDR rules are the first rules that actually mention the Singapore Convention and provide that um, Parties may request, or the arbitrator actually, excuse me, the mediator may comply with the Singapore Convention. And that was included because, as you know, here in the U.S. in particular, uh, mediation is supposed to be private, confidential, mediator can't be called in to testify and so forth. And the idea there was to give them some comfort that, in fact, if requested, they could sign the mediated settlement agreement so that it could be used to be enforced elsewhere. I also looked some time ago at the New York Convention and how many signatories did it have for the same period of time that the Singapore Convention has been in effect. And interestingly enough, while it was more, it was not a great deal more. 
And I think one of the interesting things that comes out of that examination is the fact that we know that the New York Convention was in 1958. The United States did not ratify it until 1970. And the UK did not ratify it until 1975. So I think we cannot dismiss a so-called slow start of the Singapore Convention as meaning that at some point in time, it will, will not have strength. Do I think it's going to impact arbitration? Well, if it gains in popularity, yes, it obviously will. But I do think that it's an important um, um, alternative dispute resolution technique that we should all embrace and attempt to use whenever possible. I can't you, tell your questions. You, you perfectly well, and um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, what I can see also, and is um, when uh, these step clauses or multi-tier clauses normally they appear in those uh, in, in in agreements where there is a sort of a, a relationship between the parties, and they want to keep that relationship. And so you see in big contracts, such uh, contracts involving infrastructure, etc. But I am surprised by the fact that sometimes even parties with sophisticated parties, with sophisticated lawyers, what comes out as a step clause, I don't know if there is a sort of a under they underestimate the importance of the clause or they overestimate the importance of the clause. And the, the clause itself either is problematic because there is no uh, uh, timing as to where one event starts and the other one uh, ends and starts, etc. But sometimes there are so many, so many uh, um, uh, uh, clauses or so much information that, uh, as I normally say, the better is sometimes the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can see that during the arbitration. Now, you, you've mentioned opt out. Let me ask you one question regarding opt in. Some institutions, they start amending their arbitration rules to include an opt in appeal mechanism. And uh, once I asked why, because this is sort of a conspire against the nature of arbitration per se. And the answer was simple. We are listening to the users. Do you think, uh, as an average, users nowadays, they are trying to, or there is a trend, there is a sort of a switch gears towards more a sort of a appeal process within arbitration in a sort of, of course, in a sort of opt-in, of course. Right. Um, you know, those option at, option at, optional appellate rules, the ICDR has them, JAMS has them. There may be some other institutions that have them. I don't think they're used that often. Uh, but I do think that sometimes they do give comfort. I'll give you an example. Um, had a client that I was counseling. Uh, the arbitration provision itself was a disaster. Our firm did not do the arbitration provision. Um, it looked like they were going to be um, in arbitration, but they wanted to be in court. And they wanted to be in court because they wanted to be able to appeal. But at the same time, they didn't want a number of issues in that case to be made public. And so what I suggested was, well, why don't you just agree with the other side that you'll arbitrate? That way we don't have this dispute about whether or not it's covered by the agreement or not, but that both of you agree that you will do the optional appellate rule. That way you have protected the information you want to protect, but you've also had another step of review. Um, they were very receptive to that, but as it turns out, as a good businessman, they were all able to settle their differences. So we never got past that. So I see that as one way to use the opt-in uh, appellate provision as a, a tool uh, to satisfy both parties and to satisfy the need for privacy, uh, but at the same time having an opportunity to have yet another body review it. 
And I might add, if you look at the JAMS rules and the ICDR rules on this point, you will see that they use a little bit differing standard on what they're going to review. So you need to look at that. And the ICDR rules will allow you, for instance, if you had an ICC arbitration, you may agree to use their appellate rules to have that ICC arbitration reviewed. Um, so I think in the right hands, it could be a good tool, but I don't see it as something that people are rushing to do. Right. I, I agree. But let me share with you one experience that I had once. Uh, this, that was a, a CPR case. That was a clause calling for arbitration under CPR. And there was, in, in the clause, there was a provision for an appeal within the arbitral system. And I remember quite well during the preliminary conference, the panel was trying to call the party's attention of that specific clause and perhaps to change and uh, just strike that, that part of the clause out. And the party said, no, we, we want to have that, that appeal mechanism right there. So, and that was interesting because it wouldn't be any difference for, from the, the, arbit the panel's perspective, but we consciously or unconsciously the panel members knew that there would be an appeal process. I think there was not the the, the award was rendered, and I have I, I don't know what happened, but uh, I believe there was no I believe there was no appeal. Uh, you mentioned privacy, and um, so let me ask you. Uh, uh, this is a very popular topic these days uh, about uh, not only priv privacy but transparency. Uh, how does transparency or privacy coexist with the party's right to privacy and confidentiality? Where do we go from here? Well, we do hear the word transparency um, tossed around quite a bit now that the procedure needs to be more transparent and so forth. And I think that transparency begins in the disclosure process. I think that arbitrators need to be totally transparent in their disclosures. Now, I realize that we in the United States do deeper disclosures than perhaps people from other countries, but I think it's an obligation to do a deep disclosure to protect the process. Um, and I, I give an example in which I was to be appointed by a party in which that party was a member of a worldwide conglomerate. And it turned out that two other companies within that conglomerate, my firm represented in another office in an, and the product lines were entirely different. And the party that was to appoint me did not want me to make that as part of my disclosure. And I said, it is part of my disclosure. And I made that disclosure and I was challenged, but the institution denied the challenge and thereby allowing it to go forward not having people after the fact find out that I failed to disclose something, which adds more fodder to the question of whether or not I was acting partially. And the last thing I want to do is to have my name associated with a vacature motion. The other issue with the transparency arises is this idea of third party funding. And do we need to be transparent about that? And you'll see that almost all the new rules that have come out in the last year talk about a third party funding and how it can be disclosed that there is a third party funder. And that's another part of transparency because it helps the, the arbitrators to in turn make the appropriate disclosures that they need to make. And I will tell you that my experience has been that in talking with third party funders, they welcome this particular aspect because the last thing they want is to have some award set aside because of a failure to disclose some sort of relationship with a third party uh, funder. And finally, I think the last component of transparency is publishing of the award itself. And many of the institutions now allow awards to be published in a sanitized version. Mm -hmm. Most of them allow the parties to make the determination as to whether or not they are going to be published or not. I do think publishing more awards in a sanitized version is helpful to the arbitration mm -hmm. community itself. But I also recognize that there are instances that it's impossible to sanitize an award in such a way that it would not be able to determine who the parties are. 
And in that instance, I think we definitely need to protect um, the privacy. You know, at the end of the day, people have chosen arbitration because it's confidential. Well, actually it's private. It's not confidential as we understand it, but it's private. And I think we should respect that. Um, and there is a way to make things public and that is to choose to go to the courthouse. There we go, excellent. Um, and I think our, uh, unfortunately, our time is, unfortunately, sadly, um, coming to an end, but I'd like to ask the final question. That question is to the young generation, just a piece, any particular piece of advice to the young lawyers who want to be more involved in international arbitration. What would you say to those who are knocking at your door every day, every time asking for advice? Well, I'd first like to start with the students because I don't think you can start too early. So if, you, if, if you're a student and you think you're going to be interested in international arbitration, you've got a lot of opportunities right now. There is the free Chartered Institute student membership that you can do. There are all sorts of free webinars due to the pandemic that didn't exist even 18 months ago. There are any number of blogs that you can um, get free. There are all sorts of reports that are done basically on a daily basis that are free. So you can really become a student of international arbitration before you get out of law school. For those of you who are in a, a law firm that doesn't have an international practice, uh, you need to do all of what I just said as a student. But in addition to that, you should attempt to find uh, a way to write so that uh, your name can get out there. And then whether or not your firm has the practice area or not, I think something that is extremely important is to, as a young lawyer, to learn to write well, learn to write efficiently. And, and this, is a, this is a skill that many do not have. Learn how to cross-examine. If you can write well and if you can cross-examine well, you will be a success in international arbitration. Excellent, brilliant. And Ryan Robinson, thank you so much for your time, for your experience, for your knowledge, and for your lights. With that, we conclude our session, and thank you very much. Well, thank you. I had a great time. It was good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.